Okay, yesterday we left off here. I know that for some of you, a lot of what we saw yesterday was much review, and we're going to continue on with that. Hopefully some, today you'll see some things that are new. You will see a question on the ACT regarding function notation. Determine f of negative 3 given f of x is 5 minus x squared minus x cubed. No, you just plug in negative 3 for x. So you should get f of negative 3 is 5 minus that negative 3 quantity squared minus negative 3 quantity cubed. Now, some of you, I put this down, you, you think, well, Mr. Gens, you know, well, of course we know how to plug the number in. Well, the ACT is notorious for checking not one idea but multiple ideas. So while you know how to plug it in, what do you think is the most common mistake people make here? The negatives. There's negatives everywhere, right? So you can see all of a sudden your anxiety raises because you got negative numbers. So minus 9, because when you square the negative, it becomes positive. And then it will be a minus negative 27 or plus 27. So, and then the order of operations. Some people take the 9 plus the 27, okay? Um, don't want to do that. You want to do 5 minus 9 is negative 4 plus 27. And negative 4 plus 27 is 23. If I make a mistake, let me know. You give me the look like I made a mistake. Okay, very good. <laughs> Just trying to read your eyes, Aureli. Here we go. Uh, we're going to skip that problem. Uh, we're going to go to compound inequalities. Compound inequalities. Want to sketch the solution and solve this graph. Um, anybody know what you will do to solve this? A couple ways of doing it. What do you want to do? I like to make two inequalities. I like to go negative 2 is less than 3 minus x. And I like to do 3 minus x is greater or less than or equal to 8. So I like to make two inequalities. And as I solve them, I subtract 3 from both sides. I get negative 5 is less than negative x. Subtract 3 from both sides. Negative x is less than or equal to 5. Divide by the negative, 5 is greater than x. Divide by the negative, x is greater than or equal to 5. Negative 5, excuse me. And so if you graph these two, notice you have x is greater than or equal to negative 5. So we have a closed circle, arrow going that way. You have x is less than 5, so arrow going this way. Absolute value inequality. Can somebody tell me the two inequalities I set up here? Good, x plus 2 is less than negative 5. So we have the same inequality. The way we take the absolute values off is we keep that the same. We just uh, we have a positive 5 and a negative 5, and we switch from positive to negative. I think you know how to solve from there, don't you? <clears throat> I want to just also say that, good morning, good to see you, that this is a great or. You can see great or, so therefore you know that the arrows will go apart from each other. They will not come together. Whereas in this situation, you have 2x plus 4 is less than 10. And then 2x plus 4 is greater than negative 10. And this is a less than situation. So you're going to see the arrows come together here. Remember our absolute value inequalities? Great or, less than, good way to check them, make sure your answer is correct. You set up two of the equations, make sure you switch the sign on the one and make it negative. Solving quadratics, you will have at least one question on solving quadratics. They can be of any form that you see here, really. If you see x minus 2 times 4 minus x is equal to 0, what are the two solutions? Two and two and four, right? That's it. It's already factored for you. This one is not factored for you. So what would you do? Factor out an x. When you factor out an x, you're left with
And so my two solutions are? And zero. Remember, the fundamental theorem of algebra says that the degree of the equation tells us the number of solutions that there is going to be. So because it says squared, I will have two solutions. Please note that if you see this situation, say there are the three in front, a lot of people will list the solutions as zero, four, I'm sorry, two, four, and zero. It, the three does not indicate that there's another solution. It's just a multiplier. It's just a common factor that you take out. If there was an X out front here, then yes, you would include a zero. That would be one, two, three, third degree, three solutions. See the difference? Okay, so sometimes you don't need to factor. 12X squared minus three, or 12X squared is equal to three. We can simply divide by 12. And we get a fourth. What is the square root of a fourth? Square root of the top, square root of the bottom. Plus or minus one half. Again, we have two solutions. Do the last one on your own. Good morning. I have negative 6 and positive 4. We good? All right. Good review of the heart of algebra. You are going to see problems that involve radicals. In order to add two radicals together, I must have, we call it the same radicand. So uh, Abby's doing this thing. Okay, she's not dancing. She's just kind of doing good stuff. So I, I can't add these together right now. I first must find a common radicand, which is going to be two roots of nine roots of two and then three roots of 25 roots of 2. So you can see now that we will end up with the root of 2 as our radicand. Root of 9 is 3 times 2 is 6. 6 roots of 2. Root of 25 is 5 times 3 is 15 roots of 2. I get 21 roots of 2. How about if I multiply them? What do I do here? What do I do with the 4 and the negative 3? I get negative 12. What do I do with the 2 and the 6? Am I done? No, because you can reduce the square root of 12, correct? So negative 12, root of 4, root of 3. The root of 4 is 2, times negative 12 is negative 24, root of 3. And then you see a problem like this. Am I allowed to leave the square root of 3 in the denominator? So what would you do? Multiply top and bottom by? Root of 3. Or do it the easy way. Do you agree that the root of 6 is the same thing as root of 3 times the root of 2? Is that easier? So there are times on the ACT, and that's why it's timed, folks, so that it can tell when people are able to use the simpler method and solve it more quickly. See what I'm saying? Now, I want to show you a strategy that I used, okay? I was extremely slow at the reading section. Was not very good at all, okay? I was a slow reader, still on the slow reader, because I just really don't read, okay? Um, and that's a fault of mine, and I apologize for it. But I was very quick at the mathematics. I always had time left over on the math. So if I was concerned about that answer, here's what I would do. I would take two roots of six divided by the root of three. And I would see what I get. I get 2.82. Then I would take my answer, two roots of two, and I would see that I had 2.82. Excellent mathematicians, the best, always know how to check their answers. Every single problem up here, you can generally check your answer some way. This is a classic one in which you would be able to. We move along. Scientific notation. You boy. Ugh, right? It's not too bad uh, because 6.2 divided by 3.1 is 2. So 2.0 times 10 to the, and what do you think we do with this negative 2 power here? We move it on up. Comes 9, right? Look at that. 
And then you get 2 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 4 times 10 to the 8th. Well, obviously that's going to be 0.5, right? Times 10 to the what power? 15th. In scientific notation, do we leave the answer as 0.5? We must move the decimal point this way to be 5.0 times 10 to the, what now happens to the 15? Re reduces to 14. We lost a place there. We did not gain one. We lost a place. Lost a place. Okay. All right, now we're getting into some more of the challenging questions. Where is there a vertical asymptote for y equals 4x plus 2 over 3 minus x? You may want to guess the location, the x value for the vertical asymptote. Do you remember what a vertical asymptote is? You know... I don't know if you remember this, but we actually, we got really good at graphing stuff like that. Like, we remembered that the parent function looked like this. You guys remember graphing that parent function? And then we said, well, it's going to be shifted two units to the right and three units up. So we had a horizontal asymptote here, and we had a vertical asymptote there. Notice that the vertical asymptote happens at x is equal to 2. Why does it happen at x equals 2? Because that's where the function is. So for the u, undefined, right? That's where my function is undefined at an x value of 2. So if you look back at this piece, you can see very plainly that where does this have a vertical asymptote? x equals 3. So in order to find the vertical asymptote here, I would simply just factor the bottom to x times x minus 3. How many vertical asymptotes does this one have? It has two of them. And they happen at x equals 0 and 3. Now, be careful because in this situation, we have y is equal to x minus 1 over x minus 1 times x plus 1. So people often say that there are two vertical asymptotes. And there is not. There is one. Vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. There is a hole in the graph at x equals positive 1. If it divides off, that does not create an asymptote. That creates a gap, a hole that sits within the function. I highly doubt that you will have a question that asks about a gap that exists within a graph. But a vertical asymptote, definitely possible. See if you can find the next term of that sequence. The next term. Go ahead. Did you get 162? How? Yep, you can see that it is multiplying the previous term by 3, correct? So then what would be the next term in this situation? Negative 55. We subtract each term by 15. One of those is arithmetic, and the other one is geometric. When you multiply each term by 3, we say that that is a geometric sequence. And in fact, we said that the rule for the geometric sequence is the a sub nth term is the first term times 3 to the n minus 1 power. We did that right before you guys went on winter break. And then we called this next one up here, we called this arithmetic. And we called it arithmetic because you're adding the same number each time. In this case, you're, you're subtracting 15. 
and I don't know if you remember the rule, and I don't, they will generally always give you the rule. You just have to understand if they say arithmetic, don't freak out. It's the a sub nth term is the first term, uh, plus your difference, which is negative 15 times um, the quantity n minus 1. So that's how they do that. So if you see something like that, don't freak out. Just, you know, try to make use of it. What you did is you used what we call a recursive definition. You said, I'm just going to subtract 15 each time, or I'm going to multiply the previous term by 3. And that's absolutely fine. You should be able to sketch graphs rather quickly. See if you can make a quick sketch of these two graphs. Try to put down anything you can. Guarantee you're going to have a question on the ACT that involves transformation of functions. True or false? On the ACT, you can use your graphing calculator. True. So why not just punch those into your calculator and graph them? Right? No problem there. So what the ACT will do is they will say, this is the graph, and it will list four options for equations that it matches to. See what I'm saying? You could still type in all four, couldn't you? Is that going to take you a lot of time? It will. So it's best just to know the transformation and execute it right away. People often make the mistake with the horizontal shift. They see the plus 2 and they move it right 2. Remember that that is back 2. That's something you need to keep in mind. That helps us to also identify things such as domain and range. I think that the best way to identify domain and range is to do it graphically. So as you see the square root of 5 minus x plus 1, you know that the parent function looks like this. If it's 5 minus x, remember that is the square root of negative quantity x minus 5 plus 1, if you factor out that negative. So what is the x minus 5 going to do? It's going to shift it to the Right? Five units. What's the negative going to do? Is that going to be horizontal flip or a vertical flip? Is it on the inside or outside? It's on the inside, right? Outside would be here. This is still on the inside. It's underneath square root size, so it's going to create a horizontal flip. And the plus one will shift up one. So one, two, three, four, five. And then up one. And there's my graph. Now, you could sketch that on your calculator as well. Domain is the possible input. So if it asks you for the input, you would say it goes from negative infinity to positive 5. Whoop. Slow down, Mr. Gintz. And that would be my domain. The range, it looks like it starts at 1, and it goes all the way up to infinity. True or false, this is a function. True. Why? It does pass the vertical line test, which is our test. Hello, thank you so much. Congratulations. I always knew you could do it. Passes the vertical line test, it is a function. If you wanted to determine whether what the domain was from the very beginning, remember you would take 5 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. So if you can't do it graphically, you could always do it what we refer to as analytically. You would come up with the same piece. You might be asked to solve a system. What are the two ways that we had to solve systems? 
Elimination or substitution. Do you think you use substitution or elimination here? Substitution, how about here? Elimination. Go ahead and see if you can do those two using substitution and elimination. Get X is 3, plug it back in, Y is 7. Here you multiply by 2, you get 2X plus 6Y is equal to 8. Negative 2X plus 5Y is equal to 3. Add them together, you got 11Y is 11, so Y is 1. It looks like X is 1 as well. Isn't it impressive when you look back and realize how much math you've learned? And although you maybe didn't retain it all, I bet it's starting to come back to you a little bit more and more and more and more as we go through. Composition of functions. Oh, and now we're starting to get to those problems, you guys, where it's like you could get a 33 on the math section. How exciting would that be? Composition of functions. What do I even do? What do I even do? Oh my goodness, and now we're realizing that a lot of the ACT problems really aren't that difficult. You just have to know what to do. What do I do with the 3? It says f of g of 3. Which means f of g of 3. So where do I plug the 3 in first? Into the g function. And when I plug it in, I get 12 which equals f then of 12. So once it goes in for this, I get f of 12, plug the 12 in, 2 times 12 is 24, minus 1 is 23. So you do see the number of students who are not taking the college level course, when they see that, they will have absolutely no clue, right? Yet, is that a difficult problem? No. So let's get it right. Determine f of g of x. That means I take the entire g function and dump it in there. And so f composed of g is equal to 2 times 4x plus 1, or 8x plus 1. Not too bad? Yes. Oh, minus 1, excuse me. Arithmetic or geometric, arithmetic or geometric. You try to decide. Take 20 seconds, try to decide. Go. We just talked a little bit about it. See what you can remember. Man, you guys are smart. Just think how tough this stuff would be if you weren't so smart. Okay, top one is geometric because you were multiplying each time by a number. Bottom one is arithmetic because you were adding each time by a number. Determine the rules for those. The geometric sequence is a sub n is equal to, and it's just the first term. What is the first term in the geometric sequence? Two times, what is the ratio? What are you multiplying by each time? Four raised to the n minus one power. That is the rule. The arithmetic sequence, again, you just take the first term, which is, and you add it to, what is the difference each time? What are you adding each time? 4 times n minus 1. Do you see how similar the rules are? <laughs> okay, they both have an n minus 1. They both have the, the uh, you know, whatever the difference or whatever is, and they have the first term. So, just got to remember that. Oh, goodness, what if you get trigonometry? What are you going to do? Are you remember any of it? No. <laughs> Good thing we're reviewing. 
Sine of 30. What if they ask you the exact value of sine of 30? Oh my gosh, I got to make a, a, a chart here, don't I? I got to make like a 30 degree angle. Oh no, what is the terminal point for 30 degrees? Do you remember? We know that this is 1. Rid of 3 over 2. And 1 half. Is sine the x value or the y value? The y value. So sine of 30 is 1 half. The tangent of 135, I sketch 135. What kind of special right triangle do I have over there? Not a 30, 60, 90, but a 45, 45, 90. What's the terminal point there? Yeah, negative root of 2 over 2 and root of 2 over 2. If I divide those, they're the same, aren't they? But one's negative, so I just get negative 1. Cosine of 180 degrees. Well, that, that's right over there. What's that coordinate? Is cosine the x to y value? X, I get negative 1. Oh, no. What if they do this to you? Tan find tangent of x given sine of x is 3 fifths. Oh, my gosh. Really? They expect us to do that? It's basically straight off our last test, isn't it? If I know a sign, what do I have to find if I want to figure out tangent? Most important formula in all of trigonometry, folks. And when you perform that, you will come out with 9 over 25 plus cosine squared of x equal to 25 over 25. Cosine squared of x is equal to 16 over 25. Cosine of x is 4 over 5. So if sine is 3 fifths and cosine is 4 fifths, I can simply divide them. And when I multiply by the reciprocal, I get tangent of x is 3 over 4. That is not how I would have done the problem in high school. Can I show you the quick way? I make a triangle. Sokotoa, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? Three, five. What special triangle is it? Three, four, five. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. It's three, four. It's done. That's how I would have done it. Morgan is giving me the look like she has thoughts in her head. She wants to express angst and frustration. Why I didn't show her this sooner? Is that it? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I visited with some staff about this single question about how do we, because a lot of times, probably only a third of the problems that we actually do, do we, did we do them that way when we were in high school? Uh, Two-thirds of them we, we would have done a different way. So how do we, uh, how do we create... Uh, an atmosphere where, where people feel free to try different ways, but also give people confidence that there's one way of solving it. So next year when I teach this, we'll go through the sine squared plus cosine squared piece as we did. But after doing a day or two of that, I will then show people what I refer to as my tricks or cheats or shortcuts. I just find that sometimes people get confused why that works. Do you know what I mean? And here's the problem. That's not the unit circle anymore, is it? No, it's not. And so all of a sudden when we leave the unit circle, people start to get scared. Because the you know, unit circle is a circle of life, right? Oh my goodness, what if we have to graph trig functions? Could you do it? Could you do it? Or, or would you not? What's the amplitude? Three. What's the period? How do I find the period again? I take 2 pi and divide it by, and divide it by a half. If you take 2 pi and divide it by a half, what are you going to get? Multiply by the reciprocal, and you get 4 pi. So I'm going to mark off 4 pi. Does sine start at the max, the min, or the middle? 
Yeah, it starts at the middle. Is it going to start by going up or going down? Down. Folks, they're not going to ask about secant and cosecant, tangent, stuff like that. But you might see one about sine. Cosine. Well, this isn't bad because I know the amplitude is a half of a unit. And the period is just 2 pi. So what is that x minus pi over 2 thing? What does that do? Shift horizontally. Is it going to go to the right pi over 2 or to the left pi over 2? To the right. So remember, we sketched a ghost graph. Does cosine start at the max, min, or middle? It's going to start at the max. So remember, I sketched a ghost graph so that I could see what it looked like before the shift. And then after the shift, you can see what's going to happen. It's going to, everything's just going to move. And it, isn't it interesting when it shifts, it becomes a sine graph, doesn't it? Yeah. Hopefully it's all coming back to you as best as possible. I want to know, like here's what I want to know as a teacher. I want to know, like by doing ACT review, how much does that increase your math score by? Like does it cre increase it by a whole point or four points? Or maybe it only increases it by like a tenth of a point. Then it's like, is it really worth doing it? You know what I mean? But I don't know. All I can do is just gather your feedback in the long run. Logarithms, no! What if they ask a question on logarithms? Right is a logarithm. Log, base, what's the base? Two, what's the number that goes in the middle? Eight, <laughs> equals three, all right. So my friend Brenda Nelson, she used to, she used to do the loop-de-loop, -loop, okay? She would go, two to the third is eight. That's all she thought of it. I called her stupid, so no, I'm kidding. Uh, that's fine. So how about this one? Log, do we have to write the base of 10? You don't have to write the base of 10. Of 1 over 1,000 is equal to negative 3. Sweet. You go ahead, try to write the next two as an exponential, and try to write this next one also as a single logarithm. See what you can just remember. Just try. Did you get those? Right is a single logarithm. Uh-oh, I'm going to have the natural log of x to the second plus the natural log of y to the third minus the natural log of z to the fourth. Remember how I got those? The numbers out front can move up to be exponents. And then if you have addition, you can turn addition into... <laughs> oh, try again, try again. No, try another. You can turn addition into multiplication. You can turn subtraction into division. Where you guys go? Yeah. Isn't it incredible that we at one time learned that? And, and not only did you test on it, but you did well on it. You know what I mean? And then it just, just leaves the brain. So here it comes back. Congratulations, you made it through the algebra and function section. Way to go. Nice job. <laughs> I hate this. I'm so bad at this. This is the worst ever. Nobody can ever figure this out. Okay, let's look at this situation and let's suppose that angle one is 60 degrees. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I just pulled out a sheet and I said, 
Suppose it's 60 degrees, okay? And, and let's suppose that angle 8 is 50 degrees. Can somebody tell me another angle that you know? What is angle 5? 60. Why? Yep, parallel lines cut by a transversal. We say that these are corresponding angles. And corresponding angles are congruent, right? Yep. So they're, they're in the same spot is the idea. If 8 is 50, what other angle do you know? Yeah. 6 is 50. Why is 6 50? What do we call those? Vertical angles. Yeah, so I use the term vertical angles. Sometimes people use opposite. Why is 460? Again, we have vertical angles, so that's 60 degrees as well. What is angle 7? Why? It's it's a what we call a linear pair. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh boy, what's angle two? We're almost there. Why? They're they're what we call. Corresponding, they're in the same spot, so 50 degrees. And then what is angle 3? 70, because 50 and 60 make 110, and then 70 will make, in fact, at 130. <laughs> I will say that I have not spent a lot of time reviewing geometry in previous years. I put forth a fair amount of geometry review with this because I've seen that it tends to be that it seems like those two years away from geometry really seems to hurt you on your ACT score. And so um, I think that that's definitely an area where we can improve. So let's look at this, area and perimeter of triangles and rectangles. Suppose I would like to find the area of this shape right here. That looks a little bit involved, but what two shapes do I have going on there? Very good. A rectangle and a triangle. Now, how do I find the area of the rectangle? Base times height. It's not a square because we have two different dimensions, right? So we have 4 times 5 is 20. And then if I want to find the area of the triangle, what's the formula for area of a triangle? So 1 half times the base, what's the base of the triangle? 5 times, what's the height of the triangle? This is all 10. And this is 4, so I have 6 left for the height. So I have 30, 30 times 1 half is 15, so the overall area is 35. Good job. We're going to get as far as we can because tomorrow we'll finish this, and you guys will be then at, uh, actually practicing ACT problems in class on uh, Thursday and Monday and part of tomorrow. So, okay. Um, integer use of the Pythagorean theorem. Integer use of the Pythagorean theorem. This is important because it's good to know your uh, your triples. We've already said 3, 4, 5. Can you tell me if 3, 4, 5 is a triple, then what else is? 6, 8, 10. 6, 8, 10. You could multiply 3, 4, 5 by anything, anything, okay, and you would end up with, you know, so, you know, like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, that works as well.
Can anybody give me another triple other than 3, 4, 5? 5, 12, 13? Yep. 8, 15, 17? <laughs> people usually bring this up at this time they're like I can't remember this stuff yes you can I've seen you take Haney tests I've seen you take western tests I've seen you take all sorts of tests <laughs> where you have to memorize things all the time so just make sure that they correspond with the appropriate parts uh, in this case 10 must be the hypotenuse meaning 6 and 8 must be the legs so if 6 was a hypotenuse then you can't use 6, 8, 10 Okay, so obviously x in this situation is 10, and in this situation y is 5. Yes. Boom. Thank you. <laughs> Let us end our discussion today with this last question, um, which is a little bit complex. A room measure is 10 by 12 by 9 feet tall. What is the longest distance corner to corner in the room to the nearest tenth of a foot? So let's think about what the question is asking. I have a room. And try to, and, and they'll most likely provide a drawing of the room. <laughs> one of the classes you have to take in college is called drawing shapes, and so once you, if you're a math teacher, you have to, you have to. Not just, not just anybody can do that. It trust me. It's, okay. All right. All right. I'll show you the trick. Okay. Watch. Draw a box. No, 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 Morgan, watch. Draw a box. And then put a box just a little bit offset from that box. Oh, nice. Connect the corners. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yep, you're, you're right, because you're a two dimensional surface there. And we want to find that distance. And we are going to run out of time, so we'll have to pick up that problem tomorrow. Let me give you your assignment, your assignment. Yeah. Yeah.